The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Fathers and mothers of America, attention, please. Upon the training you give your children today depends the future of America. Our system of free enterprise, personal liberty, and democracy cannot exist without educated and enlightened citizens. In about 14 minutes, our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will have some helpful suggestions for parents. If you wish to equip your children to take advantage of all the opportunities the future offers, don't miss this important message. Tonight's FBI file, Death for a Draft Dodger. No other soldier in the world is prouder of the uniform that he wears than the American soldier, nor grumbles as much because he is in it. That is an American boast because we are proud of the fact that we are not traditionally a nation of goose-stepping professional soldiers, that we are instead a nation of peace-loving people who cherish the handshake far more than the hand salute. Therefore, none of us censors the young man who answers the call to uniform with a good, healthy American grumble. Nor do we censure the parent who joins him in it. But we do condemn the young man and the parent who, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, who conspire to evade that call. We condemn them in the name of those millions of Americans down through the 170 years from Bunker Hill to the Bulge, who likewise grumbled at the call to duty, but who gave, or stood ready to give, the last full measure of their devotion to it. In the Davenport home at Great Bay, Long Island, Richard Davenport III, a member of what the Society of Pages of the New York Papers call the Long Island set, is sitting despondently in the library. He hears footsteps in the hall and calls out. Is that you, Mother? Yes, Richard. Have you got a moment? Why, of course, darling. Oh, I thought you'd gone sailing with Nanny Hartford. Well, I... I'd planned to, but... There was some rather distressing news in the morning mail. What do you mean? Look at this. Mm -hmm. Greetings from the President. What? The draft board has ordered me to report for my physical. Oh, Richard! But there must be some mistake. No, I'm afraid there isn't. I'm to appear two weeks from today. Well... I never heard anything so outrageous in my life. What do they want with you? The war is over. I know. You've already made your sacrifice, working in that defense plant, buying bonds. They don't consider that essential any longer. That's why I'm being called. Well, I won't stand for it. You're 26 years old. You've done your bit. Let them, let them call in some of the riffraff, young men with no future. Put them in the army. No, no, Mother. There's nothing we can do. You'll run along. Oh, you... Poor, poor darling, you're being so brave. No, I'm not really. Honest, I, I, I don't want to go. And I'm going to see to it that you don't. But, Mother, what can we do? I don't know, but there must be some way to keep you out, and I am going to find it. On the morning several days later at the Davenport home... Mrs. Davenport brings a breakfast tray to her son's bedroom. Richard? Mm. Richard, dear. Uh-huh. Wake up, darling. Uh, well, what is it? I have your breakfast tray here. Oh, bring it back later, Mother, please. Uh, Wait I a minute, son. To... I have some very exciting news. Hmm? It's about your going into the army. I found a way to keep you out. Well, what did you say? 
The army isn't going to accept you. Now, come on, wake up and listen to me. Well, what is this? Well, I went to a dinner party last night at Helen Brockton. Mm-hmm. Her son is just about your age. Yes. Well, during the war, he did a magnificent job in a defense plant, just as you did. Uh-huh. And a few weeks ago, he also received a call from the army. He went down for his physical, and they wouldn't accept him. Oh, Mother, that doesn't Let say... Let me finish, they're... please, dear. There was a special reason why he wasn't accepted. There's a... There's a doctor that Helen met a few weeks ago. Uh-huh. He gave her son some sort of uh, treatment so he couldn't pass the physical examination. Oh. And darling, we have an appointment to see him the first thing in the morning. Mrs. Davenport was not the only one who had developed a personal interest in the doctor. Earlier that morning, in the New York field office of the FBI, Special Agent Gregg was summoned to the office of assistant to the agent in charge, Barnes. You sent for me, Mr. Barnes? Oh, yes. Come in, Gregg. Just received a general bulletin from Washington you can start working on. Yeah? What is it? A man and his wife posing as a doctor and a nurse assistant. Huh? Yes, the case just came to light out in San Francisco. Several months ago, the fake doctor helped a couple of young men to flunk their army physicals. <laughs> I thought that went out when the war ended. Well, there's evidently a market for it still. Now, here's a full description of the couple, and uh, photos are on the way. Uh-huh. Uh, how do they operate? Well, the familiar pattern. They administer increasing doses of a drug until the so-called patient has a simulated heart condition. Then after he flunks the exam, they bring the heart back to normal with a counteragent. Well, what I meant was, how does he manage to operate as a doctor? Oh, well, well, in California, he used a forged diploma from Golden Gate Medical and a forged state license. I see. Did they skip out of California? Yes, and so far there's no lead on where they've gone. Uh, what's our move? Well, just in case they're headed east, how about checking with the Army here for any recent rejections because of bad hearts? Okay. Particularly young men from well-to-do families. Right. Get it right away, Greg. <laughs> Hello, my dear. Well, where have you been? What? Mrs. Brockton's sending a patient over to you. Oh? Mrs. Richard Davenport II. She'll be here any minute with her son, Richard III. That calls for a Shakespearean couplet, my dear. Oh. But I have more important words for you. What are you talking about? I have this day concluded negotiations for the purchase of a 23-room house. A house nestling high among the pines in the glorious Adirondacks. How many drinks have you had? Mildred, my love, we've planned right along the establishment of a private sanatorium. Yes, of but... Of course, the purchase of the property has rather done in the exchequer, so we shall spare one or two more lads the inconvenience of going into the army. And then, as the saying goes, blow. And that should be Richard III now. Then cut out the Avon accent and start making like a doctor. Yes? I'm Mrs. Davenport. Oh. Oh, yes, of course. Mrs. Brockton just telephoned. Uh, won't you and your son come in? Thank you. Come along, Richard. Very well, Mother. This is Dr. Boone. Good morning, madam. Hello, doctor. I, uh, I hope you don't mind Mrs. Brockton telling me about everything. I'm sure I can rely on your discretion, Mrs. Davenport. Of course you can. I place my reputation and my personal fortune at stake each time I perform such a service. I'm sure of that. And I'm willing to do it only because I believe that the sons of our better family should remain in the position to which they are born. Oh. It's for the good of our society. How right you are, Doctor. But uh, because the risk is so great to me, I feel that I should be properly compensated. Yes, of course. My fee is $7,500. Oh, well, uh, well, do you uh, require it all in advance? You may arrange with my assistant to pay half of it now and the other half the next time you come in. Very well. It will be necessary for your son to remain here, of course, for perhaps a week to allow time. Dr. Boone. Yes? Uh, is, there, is there any possible danger in the treatment, I mean? Well, if it were administered by a charlatan, yes. But by me, a physician, none whatsoever. Come in, 
Mr. Barnes. Oh, come ahead, Greg. I've checked on three heart cases so far that the Army rejected, but they're all legitimate. I'm getting a couple of more this afternoon. Received a bulletin early this morning from Washington, relayed from the San Francisco office. Oh, have they got a lead? Yes, the fake doctor bought a used car from Dealer there about the time he disappeared. He must have bought it for traveling. He did. He went to St. Paul. How do you know? Well, Mason in the St. Paul office just called. Oh. The doctor sold the car to a dealer there four weeks ago and booked space on Northwestern Airlines for New York the same day. Well, how does Mason know? He checked transportation offices there. The airline's ticket agent recognized the photos. I see. What, uh, what names did they use? Dr. Randolph Boone and Miss Mildred Taunton. Mm, then I'd better start checking the airline here for a lead. Right. Well, Mr. Davenport, how are you feeling today? Not so good, Doctor. I'm having trouble getting my breath. Well, that's a natural reaction. Have you been taking your pills regularly? Yes, sir. Every three hours. Oh, that's splendid. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Boone. Yes? May I see you a minute, please? Surely. Excuse me, Mr. Davenport. Of course. What do you want? Mrs. Davenport's in your office. She insists upon seeing you. What about? I don't know. Well, I'd better find out. You stay in there with him. Okay. I'll be back in a minute. Well, good morning, Mrs. Davenport. Good morning, Dr. Boone. What can I do for you? Well, it's been three days, Doctor. I, I thought I'd come over and see how my son is doing. He's doing splendidly, splendidly. Could I possibly see him? Well, he's sleeping right now. I'd rather you didn't disturb him. And you're quite sure he's all right? Certainly, certainly. <laughs> Very well, then. I'll come back when he's Oh, uh, by the way, Mrs. Davenport. Yes? <clears throat> I believe you were to take care of the other half of the fee when you came in. Oh, oh yes, of course. I, I, I can make you out a check right now. No checks, please. Oh? That's why my assistant had you go to your bank for the cash the other day, Mrs. Davenport. I can't afford to run the risk of any written record of such transactions as this. Oh, I'm sorry. I quite forgot. So if you don't mind making another trip to your bank now... Oh, no, not at all, Doctor. I'll be glad to. Uh, doctor? Yes? Oh, one of the patients. It's time for his next treatment. Oh, very well. You'll have to excuse me, Mrs. Davenport. Of course. I I'll be back from the bank as soon as I can, Doctor. And the balance, you recall, is... $3,750. That is correct. I'll see you later, Doctor. Now, what's the matter, Mildred? You better think of something quick. What? Something's wrong with young Davenport. Come on, hurry. But... What is it? He's passed out, breathing heavily. Good heavens. I think he's in a coma. You never saw one. But just the same, you better do something and do it quick. Richard. Richard. That's not going to do any good. Maybe you know what to do then. Might be a good idea to call a real doctor. Are you kidding? Richard. What good do you think slapping him is going to do? Well, sometimes it brings people out of a faint. This is more than a faint, and I'm scared. Oh, shut up. Richard. Richard. Wake up. Well, do something, will you? I'm trying to. You ought to remember something. You ought to read those medical books. Oh, for the books love of heaven, it. shut up. I... Look. Listen, he's... Quiet. That's that. We will return in just a moment to tonight's FBI file. Now, time for our three questions and answers on education. First question. How much more does the average man with a college education earn during the course of his life than the average citizen of this country? Would you say $10,000 more, $25,000 more? In actual fact, college men earn a total of $72,000 more during their working years than the average American. Nevertheless, the greatest advantage of education is not measured in dollars. In every community, a high proportion of the civic and social leaders are men and women whose native abilities have been developed by college training. That's why thousands of far-sighted parents make sure of their children's education by means of an equitable educational fund. 
Second question, what is an equitable educational fund? It is a plan that includes these important features. The Equitable Educational Fund makes sure that money for education will be ready when your child is ready. If you die, the Educational Fund becomes fully established. If you are totally and permanently disabled, the Educational Fund continues to build up without any further payment. Educational costs are spread out over many years instead of being concentrated in a few. Last question. How much will it cost to send your son or daughter to college? That question is answered in a memorandum recently prepared for Equitable Society representatives. It tells the cost of tuition, board, and lodging in 192 leading American colleges. In addition, it summarizes the long-range opportunities open to educated men and women in 29 industries and professions, such as architecture, dentistry, engineering, chemistry, life insurance, social service, information that every parent should have. Your nearest Equitable Society representative has a copy and will be glad to show it to any sincerely interested parent. Call him tomorrow. You'll find him in the phone book under Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, Death for a Draft Dodger. The criminal fraud has been found practicing deception for profit in almost every vein of business and professional life in America. And it is inescapable that from time to time he should make his appearance even in the medical profession. And no one is more eager to expose him than are the members of the profession themselves. For of all the professions, theirs is founded on perhaps the most sacred of all trusts, the safeguarding of human life. It was a doctor whose identity shall remain a secret in the files of your FBI. It was a doctor who first exposed the criminal quackery of the imposter in tonight's case and set the FBI on his trail. It was shortly before the pseudo-Dr. Boone's drug administrations produced their fatal result in his improvised clinic on Long Island that Special Agent Gregg stepped up to the counter of the baggage check room in New York City Airline Terminal. Are you in charge here? Yes, sir. I'm a special agent of the FBI. My credentials. Mm-hmm. Well, what can I do for you, sir? About four weeks ago, a middle-aged man and woman came to the terminal by limousine from LaGuardia Field. Mm-hmm. They reached here about 10 a.m. Mm-hmm. They had six pieces of luggage, and they went first to the northwestern counter to make an adjustment about... Excess baggage charges. I see. Now, the clerk over there seems to remember the man asking where he could check the bags for the time being. And the clerk directed him to your counter. Oh. Would you still have a record of the bags being checked here, even if they were picked up later? Not if he picked them up himself. But if he had somebody else pick them up or had them delivered somewhere... We'd have a record of that. I see. Now, tell me, uh, do you recognize the persons in these photographs? Oh, I... I don't recognize her, but... Yes, sir, that's him, all right. How do you know? Well, that goatee and those glasses on that ribbon. Yes, he had six bags, like you say, but he only checked four. Then a few days later, an expressman came for them. I got it all down in my book here. Uh, what date was that day? The 10th of last month. And I'll find it, sure. Let's see now. Six, eight, nine. Uh, here it is. 10th. Dr. Randolph Boone. Yes, we sent the bags to Great Bay, Long Island. Good. Let me have the street and house number. Well, just don't stand there looking at the body. We've got to do something. I was just thinking, Mildred, human beings cling so frantically to life. Uh Uh-huh. Yet only death offers that which they most desire. Complete and everlasting freedom. Your philosophy's as phony as your doctor's license. Well, they both served me rather well, Mildred. Look, do you realize that boy's mother's going to be back here any minute? Well, let's go into the office. Well? I think this is a propitious time for us to retire to our sanatorium in the Adirondacks. 
Did you pick up the sanatorium stationery at the printer's this morning? It's on the desk there. What name did you give me? Dr. Beaumont. Well, that's very nice. Look, we're never going to get out of here before his mother arrives. I don't intend to, my dear. Well, what do you expect to tell her? There she is now. Just come in. She'll wait a moment. What are you doing? Preparing for our interview. But, but that's ether. That's right. Well, what are now you... hand me that sterile face mask quickly. Here. Now ask Mrs. Davenport to come in, Mildred. Okay. Come in, Mrs. Davenport. Thank you, Miss Norman. I got back from the bank as quickly as I could, Dr. Boone. Here's the rest of your fee. Oh, thank you. You needn't have been in such a hurry. I thought my son might have wakened while I was gone, and I am so anxious to see him. You know how mothers are. Yes, of course. <laughs> then I may see him now? <coughs> well, the boy is... He's still asleep. But uh, I see no harm in your having a look at him. Oh, thank you so much. But, Mrs. Davenport... Yes? It's quite important that the air he breathes be as germ-free as possible. So I must ask you to wear this sterile face mask. You won't oh. mind, I'm sure. Oh, certainly not. If you'll face the other way, I'll tie it on you. Oh, thank you. There we are. Good heavens, it smells so strong. That's right. Ether. <laughs> no, no, now just breathe deeply, <laughs> Mrs. Davenport. That's it. Breathe deeply. There. And now, Mildred, you see why I did not intend to leave without seeing Mrs. Davenport. This must be the reception room, Lawrence. But we're not waiting, Greg. We'll knock once on this private door here and then go in. Let's go. Uh-oh. -uh. Looks like a hasty exit. They must have cleaned up. Hey, and... Greg. Huh? Do you smell ether? Yes. And no wonder. Look. What? That woman on the floor. See what's in the back rooms while I look after her. I'm afraid, Mrs. Davenport, that there's not much that anyone could offer right now in the way of comfort. Oh, Richard, Richard, my son, oh, my son. We've already put out an alarm for the man and woman, but, uh, well, as far as you're concerned, that's rather a futile gesture. Oh, it's I who am really guilty, not they. I killed him just as surely as if I'd given him the drug myself. It would have been my duty to say that, Mrs. Davenport. I'm glad you've made it unnecessary for me, too. But there is one more thing I must say, no matter how ungracious it may sound. This is America, Mrs. Davenport. Her rights and privileges belong to all of us in equal measure. And so do her obligations. Your son has paid a great price for shirking his duty, but... at that, he's more fortunate than you. He doesn't have to think about it anymore. Mr. Barnes. You, you want me, Greg? Please. Excuse me. I found this in the desk drawer. What is it? A receipted bill for some printing. Dated this morning. Oh? Well, what about it? Look at the name on it. Mm, Dr. Beaumont. I'm going over to see the printer. Right. Dear, we couldn't have chosen a more dramatically appropriate moment for our arrival here. I'm tired. Look across to the east. Yon rising sun already rose tinting the waters of the lake spread below marks the beginning of a new day. And I'm hungry. Woman, have you no poetry in your soul? Are we going to sit out here all day? Very well. Let's get out, my dear. You needn't bother to what? get out. And who might you be? Special agents of the FBI, and you're both under arrest. Now, look here, whoever you are... This is who we are, and unlike yours, our credentials are not forged. Yes, but... The printer in Great Bay, Long Island, had a poor memory. But fortunately, printers always keep a sample of whatever they print. This letterhead told us where to find you, and a plane helped us beat you here. A new day, huh? Why, you stupid fool! <laughs> For the death of young Richard Davenport through the criminal administration of drugs, 
the pseudo-doctor was sentenced to life imprisonment for her complicity in his illegal practice of medicine and for consenting to violate the draft laws. The wife is now serving a long term in a penitentiary. Now I'd like to read you an important message prepared especially for this program by Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Uniform Crimes Report Bulletin containing tabulations from police departments all over the country has just been published. It reflects the greatest increase in crime since we first began compiling figures in 1930. During the war years, more persons aged 17 were arrested and fingerprinted than in any other age group. In the past six months, however, a shift has occurred. The 21-year-olds now lead in arrests. They are the juvenile delinquents who have grown up during the war years. This emphasizes that now, as never before, parents must do everything in their power to make their homes a place of learning as well as a place of living. We of the FBI have been happy to lend our assistance to this program as it is one way of enlisting your aid and assistance in our never-ending fight for a more secure America. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. But now, again, let me remind you to check with your Equitable Society representative about the safest and wisest investment a parent can make for his children's future, an Equitable Educational Fund. Without obligation, he will also show you the Equitable Society's memorandum on the costs of higher education and some of the opportunities it opens you'll find your Equitable Society representative in the phone book under the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the diamond-studded Double Cross. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another exciting story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the diamond-studded double cross on... This is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.